Hello students, this is Pratik Bhaseen. Today we'll be discussing about your macroeconomics chapter 4, Determination of Income and Employment for class 12th. Let's discuss about this chapter. This chapter got its relevance from the year 1930 when the world was faced with its most prominent economic recession that is well known as the Great Depression. The world faced its most important recession or the most disastrous recession in this year. Earlier, the economists used to study only microeconomics. But it was year 1930 which taught the economists to study macroeconomics as a subject. This chapter deals with that period. It was the most prominent economist, John Maynard Keynes, who introduced us to this chapter. The basic problem revolving around the macroeconomics is the determination of income and employment. And this is what is the title of this chapter. Under this chapter, we'll be studying about aggregate demand, aggregate supply, and how to determine the short-run equilibrium in the economy. So let us first take aggregate demand. Aggregate demand represents the total demand for all goods and services in the economy in an year. This is actually a planned demand. Whatever the consumers are planning to demand in the coming year. Aggregate demand is divided into components. The first and the most prominent component being consumption. Consumption refers to the total consumption expenditure by the households being planned for the year. Similarly, the next component is investment. Investment is the total investment expenditure being planned by the firms for the coming financial year. When we study about consumption and investment, this constitutes the two sector model. When we add government expenditure to these components, we get the three sector model. Similarly, if we include net export component, we'll get the four sector model. But according to your curriculum, you are studying two sector model. So I'll be discussing about consumption and investment. So let's get deeper into consumption. Consumption is basically the expenditures by household for the coming financial year. We call it as an ex ante figure. Ex ante means planned. Similarly, exposed means actual figures. Because we are dealing with the coming financial year, all the figures that we'll be studying in this chapter will be ex ante, that is anticipated figures. When we take consumption as a base, so consumption can never be zero. Imagine a household with no income. Its consumption won't be zero. Let's take your example. I hope that you are studying in 12th class and you won't be earning anything. You won't be earning any factor income. So what will happen is, that your income would be zero, but your consumption won't because your parents would have to pay your school fees, your expenditure on consumables, expenditure on your clothes, etc. So there will be some sort of expenditure even when there is no factor income from your part. Same goes for an economy. So let's take an example of an imaginary economy with no factor income. So if factor income is zero, the consumption would never be zero. Hence the consumption curve would always start from y-axis, marking consumption on y-axis and national income on the x-axis. This level is known as autonomous level of consumption. This level of consumption is independent of the level of income, that is it is not dependent upon income. May it be any level. So let's take an example that the Autonomous consumption level is 100. Now, taking your example, when you weren't earning nothing, you were spending something. But when you'll start earning something, your consumption expenditures will always increase and hence consumption curve will rise. Hence, there will be a direct relationship between 
consumption and national income. Same goes with the economy. So when the economy's national income increases, consumption will also increase. This increased consumption is known as induced consumption. Induced refers to dependent. So this is dependent upon the income level. So consumption is further divided into two parts. One is autonomous and the other is induced. Autonomous level of consumption refers to the level of consumption at zero level of income. And after that, when income increases, consumption starts increasing. So this refers to induced consumption. Moving on to my next component is investment. Investment is the amount of investment expenditure being planned by the firms for the coming financial year. This investment can be tied up into fixed assets or stock of raw material. For simplicity purposes, we assume the investment to be autonomous. That is, it is not dependent upon income. So when income increases or decreases, or even when income is zero, the investment will remain constant. So the curve will start from Y axis and it will be parallel to the X axis. Hence, this is known as autonomous investment or simply investment. To get AD, to derive AD, we'll get the formula consumption plus investment. So when we derive AD, it is always parallel to consumption because the difference between them is investment, which remains constant at all levels. So generally, AD will be a rising slope curve and it will be parallel to consumption. So the slope of consumption curve will be equal to the slope of aggregate demand curve. As consumption increases, aggregate demand will also increase. So summing up, I have aggregate demand with two components, consumption and investment, because we are studying two sector model. The next part is savings. Aggregate supply has two components, consumption and savings. Savings is that part of aggregate supply which excludes consumption. That is, it is that part of income which has not been consumed. As we have already discussed that consumption always starts from Y axis representing autonomous level of consumption. The savings curve will always start from the negative range of Y axis representing autonomous level of savings. They both will be equal. That is autonomous level of consumption in the positive side will always be equal to autonomous level of savings from the negative side. As we move further and our income increases, savings will also increase and it will move in an upward fashion. The point where savings curve meet the y-axis is known as the break-even point. This is the point where savings is zero, that is, the entire income has been consumed. Summing up our aggregate supply, it refers to the total supply of all goods and services in an economy. It is always equal to our national income and hence the aggregate supply curve is a 45 degree line because all points on this curve are equidistant from X and Y axis. Further, aggregate supply is divided into two parts that is consumption and savings. Consumption being that part of income which is spent. Savings means that part of income which is saved. They have their own both curves. So consumption curve starts always from the Y axis representing autonomous level and then increases with increase in income. This is the induced level. Parallelly, savings curve always starts from the negative range of Y axis representing autonomous level of savings and then moving in an upward fashion. The point where savings curve intersect the income curve is the break even point. So now let's move on to our next basic concept that is propensity to consume and propensity to save. Propensity to consume is further divided into two parts. Average propensity to consume and marginal propensity to consume. Average propensity to consume is the ratio between total consumption and national income. It is derived by the formula C divided by Y, 
where C represents total consumption and Y represents national income. As C is always positive, APC will always be positive. Similarly, if we study marginal propensity to consume, which is represented by MPC, it depicts that what is the ratio between change in consumption to change in national income. It depicts that what part of increased income is consumed. It is depicted by the formula delta C by delta Y. This will always be positive because income and consumption are always positive. Parallelly, we study propensity to save, which is divided into two parts, average propensity to save and marginal propensity to save. Like APC, APS shows the ratio between savings and national income. It is depicted by the formula S divided by Y. Similarly, MPS is the ratio between change in savings and change in national income. It depicts that what part of increased income is saved. Now let us talk about the relationship between APC and APS and similarly the relationship between MPC and MPS. The sum of APC and APS is always unity that is it is always equal to 1. As APC depicts C divided by Y and APS depicts savings by income. So when we take the LCM of APC and APS that is C by Y and S by Y, we get Y in the denominator and in the numerator we get to add consumption and savings. Moving this equation forward, we get consumption plus savings equal to income divided by income and then the remainder is 1. So this sum is always equal to 1. Similarly, MPC and MPS, their sum is also equal to 1. Whenever MPC and MPS are added, their sum will be unity that is 1. So MPC is depicted by the formula delta C by delta Y. MPS on the other hand is depicted by the formula delta S divided by delta Y. So when we add delta C and delta S and divide it by the LCM that is delta Y, we get delta C plus delta S divided by delta Y equal to delta Y by delta Y and when we cancel the numerator and denominator, the remainder is 1. So this proves that MPC and MPS when added yield the sum as 1. Now one more basic question that we have discussed four parameters APC, APS, MPC and MPS. Can any of them be greater than 1? Think of it. Yes, APC is the one whose value can be greater than 1. This is because at some points in the economy consumption tends to be greater than income. So when consumption is greater than income, APC will always be greater than 1. So let's suppose that consumption is 150 whereas our income is only 100, so my APC will be 1.5. But APS will be negative. Why so? Because savings will be minus 50. This is because if the income is 100 and 150 rupees has been consumed, this means that 50 rupees were borrowed. So when we divide negative 50 by 100, we get minus 0 0.5, making the sum of APC and APS equal to 1. But on the other hand, when we study MPC and MPS, their value won't exceed 1 and won't be less than 0. So their value would lie between 0 to 1 or from 0 0.1 to 0 0.9, talking it simply. So we have four parameters APC, APS, MPC, MPS, only APC can be greater than 1. Now let's move on to the next topic, that is the slope of consumption curve and slope of savings curve. MPC serves as the slope of consumption curve because its formula is delta C divided by delta Y. Whenever we calculate 
the slope of a curve, the formula for that is delta y by delta x. While closely monitoring the consumption curve, we see that the consumption curve's y axis is written with or labeled with consumption. The x axis is labeled with national income. So, when we calculate the slope of consumption curve, we get delta y by delta x, y being represented by consumption is delta c, x axis being represented by national income is delta y. Parallelly, the savings curve's slope is represented by MPS. The formula for that is delta s by delta y. If you closely monitor a savings curve, its y axis is always labeled with savings and the x axis is always labeled by national income. So, the formula for slope will be delta y by delta x giving delta s upon delta y and this will be the slope of savings curve. The slopes of consumption curve and savings curve depict with a unit change in national income, what is the increase in consumption and increase in savings in those curves respectively. So, now we will be discussing about consumption function and savings function. So, what is consumption function? Consumption function is actually an algebraic expression of consumption expenditure. It is represented by A bar plus B y, where A bar means autonomous level of consumption. A positive sign indicates that there is positive relationship between consumption and income. B represents the slope of consumption curve that is MPC and Y represents the income. So, summing up consumption curve is A bar plus B y where A bar is the autonomous level of consumption and B y represents the induced part of consumption. Similarly, savings function is denoted by minus A bar showing autonomous level of savings because they are always negative plus 1 minus B y. 1 minus B means MPS because B represents MPC and their sum is always equal to 1. So, B representing MPC means 1 minus B will be representing MPS multiplied by Y. Where this in the savings equation minus A bar represents the autonomous level of savings and 1 minus B Y represents induced savings. When we add consumption function and savings function, we always get their sum equal to y. So, taking up a practical question, let's suppose the consumption function equation is represented by 50 plus 0.8y. Under this, 50 represents autonomous level of consumption, 0.8 represents the MPC, Y represents the level of income and the positive sign indicates that there is direct relationship between income and consumption. So, deriving the savings function from this, I will get minus 50 because autonomous level of consumption was 50 plus 1 minus B because the level of MPC that is B was 0.8. So, 1 minus b will be 0.2 multiplied by y. So, the savings function equation will be minus 50 plus 0.2 y. Moving further, now we will be deriving the savings curve graphically from consumption curve. Similarly, we will also be doing the vice versa. First, we derive the savings curve from consumption curve. Let us draw x and y axis. On the x axis, label it as income. On the y axis, label it as consumption, income and savings. First of all, we draw the consumption curve. 
which will always start from above the origin that is at a point on y axis and it will move upwards as we have already discussed it is a positively sloping curve this shows induced consumption now mark a point on the negative range of y axis with equal gap with autonomous level of consumption and autonomous level of savings so if autonomous level of consumption is drawn at a point of distance of 50 units the autonomous level of savings will also start at a negative distance of 50 units that is it will start from the negative range of y axis so now we draw the aggregate supply curve this is the 45 degree line it is also known as income curve the point where aggregate supply curve and consumption curve intersect each other is known as the break even point this will be the point where savings will be zero so now the point where income and consumption intersect each other will be drawing a perpendicular to the x axis joining the autonomous level of savings and the point on the x axis and extending it upwards will give us the savings curve this is how we derive the savings curve from consumption now moving further we'll be deriving the consumption curve from savings curve so first of all we'll be drawing the x and y axis on the x axis mark income and on the y axis mark income savings and consumption first of all because we are given with savings we'll draw the savings curve which will start at a negative range of y axis this range represents autonomous level of savings and the savings curve will be an upward sloping curve now moving further we'll draw the income curve which will be the 45 degree line or the aggregate supply curve now we'll look at the point where savings is zero that is the point where savings curve intersect the x axis now we'll draw a perpendicular from the point of savings where they are zero to the income curve moving further we'll join the autonomous level of consumption which will always be equal to autonomous level of saving and join it with the break even point that is the point where the perpendicular meets the aggregate supply curve by joining these points and extending them upwards we get the consumption curve so now let's sum up what we have studied in today's session this chapter started from a note that we were facing the most destructive recession in our world history so we discussed about aggregate demand and aggregate supply because aggregate demand had two components c and i the formula for aggregate demand was c plus i aggregate demand represented the total demand for all goods and services in the economy in an year it was an x ante figure x ante figure means that it is a planned figure it hasn't happened consumption was that part of consumption expenditure which the households plan to consume in the coming financial year similarly investment is that part of investment expenditure which the firms plan to invest in the coming financial year consumption started from the y axis representing autonomous level of consumption and then sloped upwards that is it was showing that it is directly related to income this is the part of induced consumption the consumption curve is represented by the equation a bar plus b bar where a bar means autonomous level of consumption and b represents the slope of consumption curve that is mpc y represented income and the positive sign represented a direct relationship between consumption and income similarly the other part that is investment was assumed to be autonomous that is it was parallel to x axis this type of investment is generally seen in the government sector where the government is not worried about the income may it be more may it be less may it be no income from that productive enterprise but investment will be done 
so ad was also an upward sloping curve which was parallel to the consumption curve moving on to aggregate supply we had two components consumption and savings aggregate supply was always equal to income hence the curve for aggregate supply was a 45 degree line consumption being already discussed let's move on to savings savings curve started always from the negative axis representing negative savings which was this savings autonomous level of consumption being always negative and then when income increases savings will always increase and hence it will be an upward sloping curve the point where savings curve meets the x axis this is the break even point then we started about propensity to consume and propensity to save propensity to consume was divided into two parts apc mpc similarly propensity to save was also divided into two parts aps and mps apc was the ratio between consumption and income marginal propensity to consume was the ratio between change in consumption and change in income parallelly aps was the ratio between savings and national income and mps was the ratio between change in savings and change in national income so i hope you enjoyed this session i'll be back with a new session bye take care